Once again, we find Moses and the Israelites are camped out at the base of Mount Sinai, where the Lord has been giving Moses uh, further insights and instructions on the Ten Commandments. This section is known as the Book of the Covenants, chapters 21, 22, and 23. Ten Commandments are given in chapter 20. And so he's dealt with social and civil and religious laws that will govern the nation of Israel once they come into the Promised Land. Uh, he's got a lot more to give them instructions on building the tabernacle and then the sacrifices that will be part of the, you know, the requirements that they'll practice. But here, this final section of the Book of the Covenant, God gives them some amazing promises, and these are promises God will fulfill as he brings them into the Promised Land. Essentially, God is going to tell them, I'm preparing a place for you, but I'm also preparing you for that place. And so hopefully this will encourage some of you this morning as we look at God's word. So we pick up in chapter 23, the book of Exodus, starting in verse 20. It says, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Just as one verse can be a sermon all by itself. First of all, notice that God will bring them to the place which he has prepared for the Israelites. In the same way, Jesus is preparing a place for us, his bride, those who are saved, the body of Christ. He is preparing a place for us in glory. Jesus tells his disciples in John 14, verses 1 through 3, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Well, that ties in with the joke. There's many mansions. Anyway, there's many mansions, he says, in my father's house. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So it's basically the same promise. Here in Exodus, God is preparing a physical place for the Israelites when they come into the land of Israel. And Jesus is preparing a heavenly spiritual place for all of us, the body of Christ, and it's those of us who are saved by the blood of Christ. Our eternal home at the Lord is going to be so much better than any place you could ever imagine here on earth. We will be dwelling with God. We will be in our resurrection bodies. We will never face death. There will be no sin. There will be no corruption. That will all be eradicated once and for all. And in like manner, not only is Jesus preparing a place for us in glory, but he's also preparing us, this ongoing process, to see him face to face. We're told in 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3, Beloved, now we are children of God. That's our position in Christ. If you're born again, you're a child of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So as long as you're living in this life and you're looking forward to seeing the Lord face to face, you know that's going to have a purifying effect on your life because he could take you home at any moment. Philippians 3.20 The Apostle Paul reminds us of this powerful truth. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, hopefully you're eagerly waiting, who will transform our lowly body. I like the King James, I think it says vile body, that it may be conformed, so he's transforming us so that we might be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So he's transforming us, it's an ongoing process, it won't be until we see him face-to-face uh, -face that we will then be conformed to his glorious body. Until the Lord takes us home, we're going to face various trials. We're going to go through various hardships, difficulties in this life because we live in a sinful, fallen world. But praise the Lord, he has given us all that we need for life and for godliness. He's given us the Word of God. He's given us the Holy Spirit of God. But... God uses all the trials and tribulations that we go through in this life to help mold us and shape us more and more into the image and likeness of Christ. By the way, in biblical typology, the promised land that he's preparing the Israelites for is not heaven. 
You know, there, I know there's hymns that sing about crossing the Jordan, going into heaven, and so forth, and, and that's not true at all. But we're not crossing the Jordan into heaven because what happens when the Jews cross into the promised land? They face battle after battle. They go through difficulties. They go through hardships. The Jews had to fight in order to claim their promised land. And even after all was said and done, they will only so-called occupy the 10% of what God promised them. It's God's land. He gave it to the Jews, and they're only in, they were only in 10% of the land that he would give them. So that doesn't sound like heaven at all to me. The promised land was filled with pagans and problems and dangers and wars. And so what does the promised land picture for us as believers? This world and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can overcome the things that are attacking us in this world. After all, this world is filled with pagans, problems, dangers, and wars. This is why Paul tells every follower of Christ to put on the whole armor of God. Read it about it in Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10 there. We've got this armor to help protect us as we battle against the forces of this world. 2 Corinthians 10, Paul tells us, for though, this is verse 3 and 4, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly or you know material, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And not only all of these promises that God gives the Israelites will apply to us, but the principles that he's giving to the nation of Israel, those things will apply to us. But these promises are for the Jews. It's for the land of Israel. So take note of that because some people will try to claim, oh, the church has replaced Israel, so all these promises are now ours. No. They belong to the Jews, and God brought them back into the land as he said he would in the last days. Now look at verse 20 again. It says, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. So here we see that Yahweh will send an angel before the Israelites to keep them in the way to bring them into the promised land. The word angel, uh, as many of you know, means messenger, and I believe that this particular messenger is the pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ. Pre-incarnation simply means Jesus came into this world numerous times in the Old Testament. He's called the angel of the Lord. He's the commander of the host of God's army, as Joshua will meet him. But it's before he was born of a virgin there in Bethlehem. It's also known as a Christophany, where Jesus will appear in the Old Testament. Anytime they see God, they talk to God, or Jacob wrestling with God, it's Jesus. God is spirit, and we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. But if he's manifesting himself in a body, that would be Jesus in the Old Testament. We'll talk more about that. Look at verse 21. Beware of him. This is the Lord telling Moses and the Israelites. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. In other words, this angel has great authority. The people of Israel need to heed his voice. They need to obey his voice. Notice he had the power to forgive or pardon sins. You remember when those guys brought the paralytic to Jesus and they couldn't get in the house? It was so crowded, so they dig a hole in the roof and they lower Jesus down and he's, you know, just dropping him down before Jesus. And it's an amazing scene. And this is what we read in Luke 5, verse 20. Jesus, it says of him, when he saw their faith, he said to him, to this paralytic man, man, your sins are forgiven you. Wow, that's quite the statement. Your sins are forgiven you? And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And that's exactly the point. Only God can forgive sins. I can't. You can't. The Pope can't. Only Jesus, only God can forgive sins. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, rise up and walk? Well, they're both easy to say. 
Anybody can say, well, your sins are forgiven you. Well, how would you know? Rise up and walk. Well, that's where the rubber meets the road. If you're going to say that to somebody, they better get up and walk. And so Jesus says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, which only God can. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And we're told he was immediately healed and he leaves there glorifying God. So this angel is Jesus in the Old Testament. By the way, uh, Yahweh, the Lord here says, I'll put my name in him. Now, Matthew 1, 21, we covered these last month. Uh, the angel Gabriel tells Joseph about the miraculous conception of Mary by the Holy Spirit. And he says, she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The Hebrew name for Jesus is Yeshua or Yahweh saves. God's name is in Jesus. So later on, a couple of verses later, it says in Matthew 1, 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Again, that's exactly who Jesus is. He is God with us. So I believe this angel of the Lord is the same angel Abraham talked to. Numerous times he would talk to this angel that would appear, and it was the Lord. And in, in fact, Jesus says this in John 8, 56, Jesus tells the Jews, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, using the name of God. I am that I am, the name God revealed himself to Moses. And then we're told they took up stones to stone him. Why are you going to throw rocks at me? Or what sin have I done? No, not, or what good works have I done? Not for any good works, but because you, being a man, make yourself God. The Jews knew exactly who Jesus was claiming to be. When Jacob wrestled all night with God, that was Jesus. When Joshua was about to lead the Israelites into the promised land, that first battle, uh, Joshua met the commander of the Lord's army, and he bows down to him. He worships him. Well, you don't worship angels and get away with it. That was the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. God says this to Moses about Jesus. Look at verse 22. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into uh, in to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites all these other termites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them, nor do you do, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. A couple of things to take note of in these verses. First of all, God is telling Moses in advance all that he is going to do as the Lord goes before them. Now remember, they've been hanging out at Mount Sinai for a few months. They'll be here for about a year. In other words, as they're waiting, God is preparing. But while they wait, God is teaching them. Uh, he's preparing them for what lies ahead. This is a pattern we see throughout the Bible. This is a pattern for all of us. Uh, he's preparing what's ahead for us, but he has us wait. Uh, and as we wait, we learn, and then we start to learn how to walk, and then we learn how to enter the battle and fight the battles with the Lord. So again, if you're feeling like you're in a holding pattern today, don't forget that God is going before you to prepare his plan for you, and he's also with you right now, and He is preparing you for the next chapter in your life. He's not sitting idly by, you might think, well, I'm not really doing much. God's preparing. But you need to wait. You need to learn. You need to grow in your relationship with Him. Another thing we see here is often ridiculed by the skeptics, and they'll use verses like this. 
well, if God is a God of love, why is he going to wipe out all these people in the promised land? Why is he going to destroy them? That doesn't seem like a loving God. That doesn't seem fair. Let me try to help you out to understand what's going on here. The Bible is very clear that God is the moral judge of all nations. He saw, or we saw, how God judged all the Egyptians. We saw how he judged Pharaoh. We saw how he destroyed Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. In, in the last days, God will judge all the nations of the world, except for Israel. He will judge all the nations because they have rejected him and his word. Uh, God will even judge the Israelites when they come into the promised land because they will constantly reject the Lord. They will disobey the Lord. They will refuse to heed his words of warning. But God is very patient. He's patient with people. He's patient with nations. And in some respect, he measures time morally. He watches, he observes, and when nations, when people cross the line, and I don't know where that line is for anybody, but God does, when people cross that line, he'll say enough is enough, and then judgment will come. So it's not like he's arbitrarily saying, okay, I'm going to wipe out all these people in the promised land. He gave them 400 years to repent of their wickedness. And we see this in Genesis chapter 15, and they'll start in verse 13. This is why God judges these nations who are living in his land. Never forget, the promised land is God's land that he gave to the Israelites. His promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Genesis 15 verse 13 says, Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them, 400 years and also the nation whom they serve i will judge now, speaking of the the uh, nation of egypt he would judge them because they mistreated his people for 400 years and, and this will, where we are in exodus is about 500 years after god gave that word to abraham then he says um afterward they shall come out with great possessions we saw that earlier in exodus when they left egypt now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, and that's the time we're looking at 400 years later in Exodus, they shall return here. And he's, he's speaking to Abraham from the promised land. And here's the reason why God wants Israel to wipe them out. They shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now it is complete. At this point in history, it was complete. God gave these pagan nations 400 years to repent, but they got worse and worse as time went on. Their sexual immorality was off the charts. Their child sacrifices were off the charts. They were like a dog with rabies that had no cure. And God did not want these pagan nations infecting his people, the Israelites. Very important to understand this. All those pagan nations knew the truth about God. They all knew about God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. They all knew about God's judgment upon Egypt and how God destroyed the army of Pharaoh. Um, God puts it in people's hearts. Every uh, Here's a great book. I just thought of that. Eternity in Their Hearts. This was written back in early 1981, I believe. Uh, read it years ago. This is the last copy in the bookstore. Um, and he turned in their hearts, but he traces back, Don Richardson, he traces back all these ancient cultures, and they all believed in the ancient flood. They all believed that there was a destruction of the whole earth. I mean, it was all passed down through history, and it's just an amazing thing. God put this fear of the Lord in their hearts, and many nations just rejected God flat out. And they knew all about these judgments, and yet they refused to repent and turn to the one true God. God will warn the Jews about not having anything to do with these pagan practices. Remember in Leviticus 18, he goes through this whole list of all these sexual sins. They're gross. They're disturbing. They're you know nasty. And he says, whoever practices these things, I will destroy. Well, this is what he says in Leviticus 18 about the promised land, verse 24. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things. For by 
all these the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land, speaking of Israel, is defiled. Therefore I will visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. Again, God was extremely patient with these pagan nations. He gave them many, many opportunities to repent, but a day will come when God says, Enough is enough. All that is left for you is my judgment and wrath. If you don't know the Lord today, God might be saying to you, enough is enough. It's time to repent of your sin. It's time to turn to Jesus so you can experience forgiveness of sin, receive eternal life, and know that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. But don't keep putting him off and putting him off. The Bible's clear. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Look at verse 25. The Lord continues, you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. Once again, God gives his people promises. These are promises for the Jews going into the promised land. If you hear of replacement theology, it says that the church has replaced Israel, and so now we can claim these promises for ourselves. That's not true. God is not done with the Jews. In fact, he tells us in the word in Jeremiah, he says in Ezekiel 36 and 37, I'm going to bring my people, also in Deuteronomy, uh, he says, I'm going to bring my people back in the last days. They'll come back in unbelief. I'm going to bring them back. And they're going to come to a place where they will realize God is true. Right now, only about 10% of people living in Israel are even Orthodox Jews. But the promise is when Jesus returns at his second coming and we come back with him, all the Jews who survived the Great Tribulation, which is one-third of the world's population of Jews at that time, according to Zechariah 13, because two-thirds will be cut off, it says, but that one-third that remain, they will all receive Jesus. They will look at him, and they will mourn for him as a mother mourns for her only son. And they will say, where did you get those wounds in your hands? He'll say, in the house of my friends. And they will all turn to Christ at that moment. But these are promises for the Israelites when they come into the promised land. If you obey me, if you trust me, if, and maintain your relationship with me, avoid going into the you know these pagan practices, I will give you victory in the promised land. Yes, there's going to be difficulties. You will face hardships. You'll go through trials. You'll have difficult battles. But the key to their victories was not going to be found in their military might. It would be found only in their relationship with God. If they would trust him, if they would obey him, he would fight for them. He would use them as vessels of honor to drive out their enemies, but the Lord would be the one giving them the victory. These principles apply to us. God fights the battles for us. We walk hand in hand with Jesus today. Our key to victory is not found in some formula. Our key to victory is not found in the ten keys to a victorious Christian life. It's found simply in our relationship with Jesus. He has given us the full armor of God so that we can fight the good fight of faith. He has given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us His Word. He's given us prayer. He's given us our brothers and sisters who can rally around us when we are going through difficult times and, and life becomes too much for our, us to handle on our own. And so the first promise from God here to the Jews is that He would give them physical blessings. He says, bread and water, no sickness, healthy pregnancies, a long life. They didn't experience these things because almost immediately, even before they get to the promised land, they will disobey the Lord. They will fall short of God's plan. Just in a few chapters, when Moses is still on the mountain, they make a gold calf and begin to worship it, and God will judge them. They'll go, they're only a week away from the promised land. They'll go up to there, they'll send 12 spies in. Only Joshua and Caleb said, 
The land is ours. We just need to go in. The ten spies say, no, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're going to kill us. They're going to devour us. And because of their unbelief, God's going to make them wander around for nearly 40 years in the wilderness. And so they never experienced the promises that God had for them. But even though they were disobedient, God would keep his word. He would fulfill his promises to them. But because of their lack of faith, they did not experience all that God had for them. The heart of God for his people has always been to hear his voice, to obey his word, to walk by faith, to trust in the Lord. Don't be limited by our sight. That's God's desire for us as well. And when we do live our lives that way, we will find ourselves living on a much higher level of blessing than anything we can get out of this pagan world. If we walk with the Lord, we obey the Lord, we put off the deeds of the flesh and we put on Christ. Now, what is the world looking for? I mean, all over. This has been going on since the 60s. I can even remember the 60s. I mean... They say if you're old enough to remember the 60s, you didn't experience the 60s. Well, I was still a kid in the 60s. I was born in 56, but be that as it may, um, what was the cry? Love, joy, peace. And that's what the world is saying today. We just want love. We just want joy. We just want peace. And Satan has done a great job twisting all these things around and lying to people and giving these things new meanings, new definitions, we know what true love is. It's agape, agape love, God's love for us. God's love is love in action. Love is a verb, quoting DC Talk. Some of you are like, what? True love, it only comes from God through Jesus Christ. It's love in action. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world, he sat on his throne and did nothing. No, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's his love in action. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God demonstrates his love for us, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So God's love is on display through the gospel of Jesus but the world's concept of love is twisted, it's distorted, it's perverse, it's conditional, it's selfish, it's tolerant of sinful actions and behaviors. Basically, it's fleshly lust. That's what the world thinks love is. Love is tolerant. Love is love. Baloney. Love comes from the throne of God, and he defines what love is, not our twisted minds. Now, when it comes to joy, Satan has done a great job twisting what joy is all about. Satan has turned it into happiness. Oh, everybody should be happy, healthy and wealthy, and just get all you can out of this life, live in successful circumstances. That's what happiness is all about. So the world strives and struggles to be happy, healthy, wealthy, thinking that will give them satisfaction in this world. But nothing could be further from the truth because True joy is not based on your comfort level. True joy isn't based on what you got in the bank account. True joy isn't based on, you know, your health and wealth and anything else like that. It's solely based on your relationship with Jesus. True joy comes from knowing that God loves you. That It comes from knowing that Jesus paid the price in full for your sins when he shed his blood for you. That's where true joy comes from, knowing that when you die, you're going into the presence of God for eternity. That's joy the world can never offer. That's joy the world can never give. That's what we have in Jesus. We're new creations in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And what joy... I have, I know many of you experienced the joy of the Lord just knowing that you are safe and secure in His hands. What joy I have knowing that when I kick the bucket, I keel over, I drop dead behind the pulpit. That'd be weird for you, but I'd be in heaven. That'd be awesome. Pastor Chuck used to say, if I fall dead behind the pulpit, 
if you try to you know, revive me and then you bring me back, I'm going to smack you in the nose. <laughs> Be that as it may, our joy is knowing we are safe in the Lord. John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Again, true joy comes from knowing that when I die, I'm going to be with the Lord forever in glory. What about peace? The world wants peace. Oh, there needs to be peace in the Middle East. There needs to be peace in, you know, Ukraine. There needs to be peace in these different places, and, and, and that's what they strive for. But what is true peace? Romans 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, in other words, you're declared righteous because you put your faith alone in Christ alone, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, before Jesus saved us, we were at war with God. We were enemies of God. But Jesus has reconciled us to the Father. That's the greatest peace treaty that was ever made. Now, we also have received the very peace of God. That means you just know that you know that God has you in his hands. You just realize, no matter what's going on around you, that God is on the throne. He is in control. He's got everything working together for our good, for his glory. Even though this world seems out of control, they are trying everything in their power to seize control. Whether it's through climate change, fear tactics, you know, I Emily, he, he made it to India. Uh, he missed his flight. He didn't miss his flight. They, they delayed his flight a day because it was so cold in India. They were having record cold, 39 degrees. <laughs> Literally, they canceled their flight. Global warming? <laughs> Come on. I want more snow. You know, we need more snow in the mountains here. I'm supposed to go skiing with my brother-in-law this weekend. We need more snow. But be that as it may, here we see the fear tactics of the world. Uh, the global economic fear tactics. You know, the World Economic Forum. They're trying to, you know, put in place all these different things to bring everybody in conformity to the world and how they want to run everything. And so they're going to put all this fear into your heart's you know, we have pandemics. What's going to happen this year with the election? You know, the fear. Oh, no, if the big orange monster gets elected, everything's going to be blah. Or if Sleepy Joe gets elected, everything's going to be blah. I'm not, my hope is not in these things or these people. My hope is in Jesus. We don't have to live in fear, but by faith we look to the Lord. Here's the greatest definition of the peace that God has given us. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, whether it's the big orange monster or sleepy Joe, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And I wish every presidential candidate would look at these scriptures and memorize them and take them to heart. And when we do focus on Jesus, everything he has done for us, that is when you will experience his peace, even in the midst of whatever chaos you're facing. You know, you can get the report, you've got this, or you've got that, but you can still have peace that surpasses all understanding that comes from the Lord. Look at verse 27. God says to Moses, I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send hornets before you. This really happened, by the way. There's a lot of you know, archaeological evidence, even in history, it says a lot of these people were driven out of their villages by hornets. 
You don't want to be stung by a hornet. Those things hurt. Um, when I was in India a few years back, I got stung right there by this little horn, tiny little hornet. But man, I got some great pictures. I look like some weird caricature, you know, big bulb forehead, you know. It was just, it was not good. It hurt. It throbbed for a few days. But be that as it may, he says, I'll send hornets before you, which will drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. So certainly God did bring fear before these pagan nations within the promised land. They, for generations, had feared the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again, they knew about the flood that's been passed down all these different cultures. They knew about Sodom and Gomorrah. It happened within the promised land area. They knew about what happened with Egypt and the 10 plagues and what God did with Pharaoh, destroying Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. Remember when uh, they send in the spies and Rahab takes them in and she says, we've heard all about your God and what he has done. And she ends up getting saved. God did use hornets to drive out and confuse the people of Canaan before Israel came into the land. And what God did to Jericho, when they blew the trumpets and shouted, the walls collapsed. News of that event spread very quickly. There's one group. It's interesting how they got, I think they got saved within the promised land. And it was the Gibeonites. Remember who the Gibeonites were? Joshua brings them in. They destroy Jericho. And then after they blew it, they eventually destroy Ai. And word is spreading about what Israel's doing. So the Gibeonites, who live just around the other side of this mountain, pretended to come from a long distance. And they've got moldy bread, you know, the water's run out. They're acting like, oh, we've traveled this distance. We just want you to make a covenant with us. We just want to, you know, be your servants. And Joshua and the Israelites said, Okay, they didn't even ask the Lord if this is okay, but they said, okay, we'll make a covenant with you. And then they find out they're just around the other side of this mountain. They tricked the Israelites into making this covenant. But you know what happened? The Gibeonites ended up becoming, it says, the woodcutters, the water bearers. They would serve in the tabernacle. They would serve in the temple after Solomon's temple was destroyed. And then the Israelites come back from, the you know, people of Judah came back into uh, Israel, 500 Gibeonites returned with them. They followed the one true living God. They're the only group out of all these different tribes that repented of their sins. They took God seriously. So the point that God is making to Moses and to us is that he will go before us. He will fight the battles we are going through. Look at verse 29. He says, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. So again, he promises he will drive out their enemies, but not all at once, but little by little. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, the Israelites were not warriors. They'd been 400 years slaves. All they knew was how to, you know, carry heavy loads. They helped build the cities. Ramses and Pyth Pythus, whatever the name. Anyway, they helped build these things for the Egyptians. So they weren't farmers. They weren't at this time warriors. And so God says, I'm going to do this a little at a time. God could have blown it all up at once, but then they would be stuck. The wild animals would come in. They might take over. And so... They would systematically go from area to area, one place to another. We're told that it took them seven years to get through the promised land. God told this to Joshua chapter 1, verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. And so again, as long as they were faithful to follow God's lead and keep moving forward, God continued to bless them and give them one victory after another. And guess what? That is exactly what God is doing in your life today. God is gracious. He is patient. He is going before you. He is conquering one enemy at a time in your life. Now, when it comes to our salvation, Jesus has done all the work for us. He paid the price that we could never pay. Well, again, his perfect spotless blood. 
All we could do is believe him, receive him as Lord and Savior. And at that moment when he saved us, the battle for your soul was won. You are now justified. That's how God presently sees you. You are declared righteous, not because of any good thing you've done or anything bad thing you're doing. You're justified because Jesus is in you, and he declares us righteous. He's given us his very own righteousness. Presently, we're in this sanctification process. That's why when you look in the mirror, you think, wow, I had a bad thought last night. I did something stupid yesterday. You beat yourself up, and you're wondering, how come I'm not growing faster? Maybe I'm not a Christian. No, if you're saved, you're justified. The sanctification process is ongoing throughout our Christian life. So keep that in mind. When it comes to my new life in Christ, I'm like a little child. There's a lot to learn. I need to grow. I need to mature. And then it doesn't take too long to realize this is going to be a lifelong process. When I got saved, I mean, I used to cuss like a sailor before I got saved. And then I got saved. I mean, the Lord instantly took that away. I was drinking like a fish. Instantly, God took that away. And I thought, wow, this Christian thing is easy. As the months, years go by, it's like, man, what am I doing? Why am I still stumbling in this stupid area? Why am I still not having victory here? God is faithful to give us one victory over one area of my life. He'll give me victory over another area of my life. And so then you realize, I still got 98 areas to go. He's dealt with these two or three. I still got a long way to go. God is faithful. Philippians 1.6, one of the most amazing verses, I think, in the Bible. Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he, the Lord, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Again, perfection will only be obtained when we are taken up in glory. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Uh, 3, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So again, don't be discouraged if you're not where you thought you should be in your walk with God He's not done with any of us yet. And maybe, I don't know where God is in my life in the transformation process. Maybe he's on step 27. I got a long way to go. The good news is when the rapture happens, the rest of them get finished as well. It's all taken care of when we're out of these bodies of flesh. Yes, we are complete in Christ, positionally speaking. But practically, I know I still got a lot of battles ahead of me. But I know... The victory belongs to the Lord. So a big part of the maturing process is learning how to yield ourselves daily to the Lord, learning how to put off the deeds of the flesh, put on Christ. It's living for Him and learning what it means to be a living sacrifice to Him. It's learning how to follow Him in the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Again, it's a lifelong process of denying ourselves, dying to our flesh daily, because your flesh can rear up really quick. You can get in the flesh very easily, and so you got to keep putting that down, keep trusting the Lord. Again, the victory is ours in Jesus, but as long as we're still in these physical bodies, we will face ongoing spiritual battles throughout our lifetime. It's in that maturing process in the Lord that we discover He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us the Word of God. He's given us the Holy Spirit. I don't have to live in defeat. I can have victory. Now, let's wrap it up here. Verse 31, the last verses of the Book of the Covenant, you might say. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the sea, speaking of the Mediterranean Sea, Philistia, and from the desert to the river. And he's speaking of the Euphrates River. When you hear people chant, oh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. They have no clue what they're talking about. They even ask people on the street, what are you saying? What river? I don't know. 
They think it's the Jordan River. No, he's talking about the Euphrates River. I'm sorry, hold on. He says, from the river, For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, because it's God's land. He's giving it to the Israelites, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare, a trap to you. So here he gives them the parameters of the promised land. From the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, up the coast, all the way to the Euphrates River. This would include all of the present-day nation of Jordan, by the way. When all is said and done, the promised land consists of approximately 300,000 square miles. The most the Israelites ever got when they conquered the land was 30,000 square miles, one-tenth of what God promised them. Throughout history, they've only occupied that amount. You know what they have today? Not 10,000 square miles. Certainly not 30,000, not even 10. It's 8,600 square miles. That's what Israel is today. That is less than 3% of what God promised them. And here we got some bozos saying, we need to divide the promised land in two. Make Palestine for Israel, make Palestine for the Arabs, you know, Palestinian. It's like, are you kidding me? That would be disaster. Pray for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. I mean, he's taking a firm stance right now that we are not going to negotiate with the Palestinians. We're not going to divide the land. That's what they want because every time they've given them land, even when Yasser Arafat was the guy overseeing the, the PLO, he would say, wow, we're one step closer to destroying Israel and taking over Israel and wiping off the Jews, taking them into the Mediterranean Sea. That's their goal. That's in every charter of those groups around Israel today. Hezbollah, Hamas, every one of them. Their goal is to annihilate the Jewish people. So don't fall for the narrative, oh, there'll be peace in the land if they just divide it in half. Give the Palestinians their half. No. And until they repent and turn to God, forget it. And at this point, they aren't. They're being used by the enemy big time. But whether it was because of their unbelief, the Jewish people, or their sin, or their disobedience, they never took what God had for them. They settled for less. I wonder what percentage of God's blessings you and I have settled for. I don't know about you, but for me, I'm easily distracted. I don't always walk by faith. I don't always stand on the promises of God's word. So let these verses be an encouragement to you and also a warning to you. Don't settle for less than what God has given you. Keep growing in the Word. Keep growing in your relationship with Jesus. And never forget, He loves you. Never forget, He who began a good work in you will be faithful to finish the work that He started. Amen.